This evening our guest speaker is Sir Jeremy Isaacs. I've been told to keep it short, and I have to keep it short, because otherwise I'll spend the whole evening telling you about his distinguished career. But I think Jeremy's probably best described as a chronicler. In his career, apart from the Royal Opera House, he was making sure that everybody enjoyed wonderful opera and new building, but the rest of his career in television has been about chronicling events and communicating them effectively to bigger and bigger audiences and engaging them. And tonight I think it's very fitting that a very distinguished chronicler should actually be talking in a very personal way about a great distinguished artist and for that artist to be chronicled by Jeremy. So I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I think it's right and it's just worth remembering that this very special evening, this rare treat, is on a unique day, the 29th of February. So in case, in case anybody is thinking about forgetting this evening, just remember that this evening only happens once in every four years. <laughs> but I suspect it'll be once in every 40 years. Jeremy, it's all yours. Thank you. I dedicate these few remarks that I shall make to the memory of Mira Hammermesh, who died the other day. Mira was a painter, and rather a good one, a writer, and a superb documentary filmmaker. Like Joseph Herman, she was a Polish Jew who, by the strength and incisiveness of her work, enriched our lives. And uh, Ben Uri might consider one day putting on a modest show of Mira's paintings, and they could run the documentaries by the side of it. I must make an admission to you at this point. Sarah McDougall, whom I admire very much for her quality of her work and the superb catalogue of this exhibition that she has edited, has been sending out emails, which I'm not sure David hasn't just repeated, saying that I'm going to give an intimate eye-to-eye um, -eye portrait of uh, my relationship with Joseph Herman when he came to Glasgow. But I have to say that there are two very good reasons why I cannot do that. I'm reminded of the mayor in France who t told a French monarch, you know, there are 15 reasons, sire, why we are unable to ring the bells to greet your arrival here. The first is that we haven't got any, to which the king replied, forget the rest. <laughs> and, and I have to say that I cannot give you uh, much of an account at all of Joseph Herman's period in Glasgow. First of all, because I was eight years old at the time. And secondly, because I wasn't in Glasgow, but in Kukubrisha. I'm <laughs> therefore heavily reliant on what I can find by way of eyewitness of Joseph's time in Glasgow. I had the benefit of hearing of my parents' friendship uh, for him, and I shall make uh, um, substantial use of the memoirs of Benno Schatz, the sculptor who befriended him and made it possible for him to work in, or help make it possible for him to work in Glasgow. Um, so that's my demurral, and now I begin. And the story begins with two rings at a doorbell. And um, we're in Glasgow, it's 1940, the summer. The house whose door is banged on or rung is in West Campbell Street. It's where Benno Schatz and his wife Min Millie lived. I regret to tell you that the Isaacs children used to delight in going on about how it was Belly and Minnow and not Benno and Millie. And there are other variants of it that I've forgotten. But that's where the Schatzes lived and uh, it was Benno who opened the door. And um, this is what he says. One day I opened the door to a ring, and there stood a fairly burly man who said, I am Yankel Adler, the artist. He was a Polish refugee who'd been living for some time with a minister just outside Glasgow and had been given my name. Millie and I made him welcome. He told us he couldn't stay with the minister much longer and was looking for help. We told him to return on the following Saturday afternoon when we would invite a few friends in. Uh, he had, Benno had to go out. 
When we arrived home, there was Yankel Adler with Murray Glasser, the uncle of our David Glasser, another close friend, and Millie in conversation. The upshot of the meeting was that my friends each gave Adler enough money to allow him to work for six weeks to produce enough paintings for a show. It was going to be difficult for me to ask a gallery to hold it, as I myself hadn't seen any of his work, although Adler was surprised that I didn't know his name. I almost asked him, did he know mine? <laughs> in any case, I decided to hold the exhibition in my studio. Cleared it completely, decorated it, wrote 30 to 40 personal letters to my business friends, inviting them to the opening, provided tea for everybody, and we sold quite a few paintings. That's the end of the good news. The truth is that it immediately became apparent that um, Benno Schatz and Yankel Adler were like oil and water. They fought like cat and dog. They were proud and prickly people um, who were simply not going to be, allow themselves to be on level terms with the other. Yankel didn't want the Scottish painter William Crosby to see his paintings that he'd done up specially for this show because he didn't think they were good enough. And Benno complains that he himself was good enough to be taken advantage of. He had wanted to keep the show going for a week, but Yankel insisted on one day only the Sunday. And uh, so it didn't, um, it didn't go well. Uh, Benno suggested that he should send a painting to the Royal Scottish Academy. His reply was, and this takes real cheek, that he would first like to see what was being shown in the Academy, <laughs> and that I, Benno Schwartz, didn't really know his painting. Uh, Benno offended him. I touched him to the quick. He got up and left the house. I don't think he even said goodbye. He arrived the following morning to remove his paintings while I was at the School of Art and never came back again. I only saw him once again, years later in London, in a Soho restaurant and didn't even recognize him until he spoke to me. Now we come to the good news. A couple of months later, there was another ring at the door. And before me stood a smallish man in a soldier's overcoat. He handed me a note. It was from someone I didn't know, but before me stood Joseph Herrmann. He could speak no English, but our common language was Yiddish, and we invited him to join us for our Friday evening meal. We arranged to have some friends in who spoke Yiddish fluently. What the, the neighbors thought of all this, I don't know. <laughs> I told him, to his great surprise, that Yankel Adler was here and directed him to his studio. Joseph was altogether a different person from Adler. He himself admitted, Benno tells us, and uh, uh, Herman confirmed this in his own writings and utterance, that at the time he was influenced by Chagall. And you can see the influence of Chagall in many of the paintings on these walls. Uh, and his work was nostalgic of the circle in which he had lived. This is the painting of him painting in the home in which he lived with his father, the cobbler, his mother doing the washing, his brother studying, his sister and the cat dreaming out of the window and his grandfather saying his prayers. And the painting on Joseph's easel is a Chagall-like painting. And so, uh, Benno got him right, but Joseph, he says, had a great capacity for friendship, and this helped him to get to know many people in Glasgow. As I, we're told, was on friendly terms with most of the private art galleries, it was easy for me to introduce Joseph to them and to get the Connell sisters, he says here, to give him a show. He didn't really need much help in this, for his winning way did all that was necessary. Here is the catalogue of the show of Joseph's paintings that was uh, given in Glasgow in October 1941. The interesting thing is that Benno describes this company 
as being run by the Connell sisters, but the name of the company, and the name by which I and scholars actually know it, is James Connell and Sons of 121 West George Street, Glasgow, C2. There's a foreword to the exhibition by the director of the Glasgow Museum and Art Galleries, uh, Tom Honeyman, a very effective and influential figure. And here's what he has to say, which I read to you, not because it tells us much about Herman, though it does a bit, but because it puts this show in the context of what art lovers, if there were any such in Glasgow at that time, actually were prepared to take and to look at and to enjoy and welcome. And when Adler said, you don't know what my painting is like, what he meant was that it was too advanced, not necessarily for Ben Schatz, but for other people in the city. And this is what um, Glaswegians have, as we say in Scotland, a very good conceit of themselves. And this is what Honeyman has to say about Glasgow. Glasgow was the first city in Britain to appreciate the importance of the French Impressionists. That's true. It's a very rich city, and the ship owners and builders who, who, who earned fortunes spent it on painting. That was about 50 years ago, says Honeyman, in 1940. It, Glasgow was not quite so alert when the post-Expressionists came along, and today, he says, it is not out of place, that's then, for me to introduce Joseph Herman with the plea that you should approach his art with an open mind. Now, in those days, it was a common experience going around exhibitions of contemporary painting to find yourself in the company of people who had anything but open minds <laughs> and were absolutely determined that what was on the walls was rubbish and that they could do better themselves, and so could their grandchildren. <laughs> Here comes Honeyman again. Where we once led in the matter of art appreciation, we now follow with faltering steps. A few of our artists helped us to see the significance of Cezanne. Uh, on the wall over there is a painting of the Kelvin River in Glasgow by J.D. Ferguson, who was a friend of Picasso's and was certainly knew everything that needed to be known about the significance of Cezanne. Fewer still pointed the road of decorative design taken by Matisse. None risked the direction of expressive design followed by Picasso and Brack. Brack. Along that road are to be found artists like Rouault, Soutine, and Chagall. Soutine, like Chagall, was Jewish. If we had known even these three, this exhibition would not seem extraordinary. This is not another way of suggesting that Joseph Herman is an eclectic. It is a way of suggesting that his apparent revolutionary art this work was thought of by Tom Honeyman as revolutionary in a way, um, is, 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 and it is our fault. It's really evolutionary. It's got a history of painting behind it, which Joseph had learnt in Warsaw, in Brussels, and in his knowledge of the great painters of the world. And it's our fault, not the artist, says Honeyman, if we don't see it as such. Of Joseph himself... Honeyman says, this artist is proud of his race and is intensely interested in its history and culture. The legends and folklore form the theme of many works and quite obviously he is not a detached observer. He may be bitter, cynical, sentimental, sad and witty. It all depends on the occasion and the mood. After all, emotions are the artist's raw materials and colour, form and line are the means of transformation. The spectator may or may not be able to participate. If you, if you, he says, look at these paintings often and long, and this exhibition provides an opportunity to do precisely that of precisely these paintings, if you look at them often and long before this exhibition closes, you will find they have life. It's because of their vitality that I have pleasure in introducing them to you and I count it a privilege in having been asked to do so. There are 23 works in, this, in the catalogue of this little exhibition and several of them are represented here. The portrait of Mrs. Schott's Millie 
uh, in a bright expressive green hangs on that wall down there. Um, the, what have we got? I don't think the gamblers are here. There they are over there. But downstairs, Sarah will correct me if I'm wrong, we've got Jews dancing and um, the, an organ grinder and memory of a pogrom and various paintings of Jewish carnival by which we suppose he means Purim. And first, first on the list, and I take an absurd pride in this, is my family and I, uh, which my mum and dad bought from him. And I've been very interested looking up, I tell my cousin Irene this, looking up this, the documentation to find that my mother, um, who always had big say in anything that happened culturally and was frightfully keen on music, was completely set aside by my father's influence. I'm sure it was he who bought this painting and he who engaged in the correspondence down the years thereafter that, um, that attended every time it was requested for exhibition uh, in a show like this. Joseph tried to buy it back from my parents uh, two or three times in his, um, in his life, not in any frantic or urgent way, but he just said, I would love to have that back. Uh, but they were not. Um, they were not going to let go of it. Um, and as you will see, uh, when, I, when I hung it on my wall, I found that a little Goya etching, this is the first etching of the series of Los Caprichos, um, was on the wall already. And uh, this is a self-portrait of Francisco Goya y Luciente as pintor. And that image there is planted by Joseph in his painting uh, up there, which is a homage of one master to another, if ever there was one. The show was a success, this little show, in October 1941. And Joseph Herman was, made an immediate impact. And he, had, uh, he was very active in his pursuit of the visual arts in Glasgow, not just in putting paintings on the, on the walls, but in theater and ballet, in which he played a vital, energizing visual role these are the costumes for left-wing propagandistic drama mm. in which Glasgow, Red Clyde side, excelled. And uh, Sir Joseph was, a, was um, a very considerable figure. And, um, and people in Glasgow, in Scotland, were sensitive to it. There was a very formidable woman called Joanna Drew, uh, many years later, who became the head of visual arts at the Arts Council. And her parents conducted a salon on Sundays in Edinburgh, not Glasgow, and various great Scottish painters who were, or burgeoning painters who were members of the Royal Scottish Academy or whatever, came to tea on Sunday afternoons and everybody chatted. And one day, Joanna's mother said to him, said to her, you've got to come this weekend to the do because two real artists are coming and they're called Anchor. Yeah, and they're called um, Herman and Adler. But um, Benno Schatz reports how hard it was when he was trying to drum up support for Adler's shows, uh, it, how hard it was to persuade his wealthier friends to buy art, whether by Yankel Adler, a bit too advanced for them, or by others. <coughs> Glasgow Jury, he wrote, in this memoir, and I, it hurts me to repeat this, but I feel truth demands that I report it to you. Glasgow jury had not yet awakened to art, and we had to use sledgehammer tactics, or techniques rather, to make any impression on them. So was Glasgow then, what it always likes to think it was, uh, a capital of culture? Not quite, but it had assets, and I thought I might um, just mention them to you because I owe my passionate love of the arts and different arts to what was available to me as a young person in Glasgow. Books, music, paintings, theater, film. And of course, in, uh, 
1990, Glasgow became the first British city to be a European capital of culture and delighted in cocking a snook at Edinburgh during that happy year. And uh, Edinburgh, as you know, thinks of itself as the Athens of the North. And uh, Ken Tynan said, to the contrary, it's the Trondheim of the Southwest. <laughs> <laughs> but that didn't, that didn't stop Edinburgh people thinking they were the bee's knees. So when Glasgow was city of culture in 19, capital of culture in 1990, they put up a notice in Waverley Station in Edinburgh with an arrow pointing to the platform saying, you are 40 minutes away from Europe's capital of culture. <laughs> and that stayed there throughout the Edinburgh Festival. <laughs> well, it had a great library, Glasgow, and Ben Schotz tells us that if there was an exhibition of Judaica, including texts and manuscripts and so on in London, there would be one immediately at the Mitchell Library in Glasgow also. St Andrew's <coughs> Halls, unfortunately, <coughs> burnt down, but not before it enabled me to go to make wonderful concerts in an excellent acoustic every Saturday night. I was also taken by my mother on Sunday afternoons after an enormous lunch that she'd shoveled into us, or we shoveled into ourselves, which consisted of scotch broth, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding and potatoes, and Adam Eve pudding with apple and lemon in it. She put us in a motor, motor car and drove us to Green's Playhouse in the centre of Glasgow, which seated 8,000 people. It was the biggest cinema in Europe, and it was on about eight different floors. And I'm ashamed to say it was quite hard sitting in the golden divans to stay awake <laughs> through the music. And I was always being woken up by uh, the beginning of Tchaikovsky 4 or something like that. But Glasgow had wonderful concerts. Theatre was in the hands, as far as we were concerned, partly of the Jewish Institute players. The Sunday Times in those days ran a competition for amateur um, dramatic societies across the nation. Hundreds of amateur groups put themselves forward, and by the time you got down to the shortlist at the end, it was very competitive, tough going in good deed. And the Glasgow Jewish Institute players more than once came second. I don't think they ever came first. There was a citizen's theatre. Uh, the mastermind of a citizen's theatre was the great playwright James Bridie. His real name was O.H. Maver. And he wrote many plays that were shown there. And also they used to show the work of Paul Vincent Carroll an Irish playwright, and if you're doing anything in Glasgow, you have to keep remembering that there are as many Catholics in the city as Protestants, and you've got to be fair to both of them. I once astonished a young man who was trying to ask me to buy a, f a flag to put in my lapel for the, for the SV de, de P, that I didn't know what SV de P meant. He was horrified. He said, St. Vincent de Paul, of course. Um, but I the best remember the Citizens Theatre for um, a pantomime, which they did every Christmas, because they were in the New Year. They were in what was the Princess Theatre in the Gorbals, where my grandfather was a minister in a local synagogue and where Janine's Kosher Restaurant exhibited dreadful people like Chico Marx of the Marx Brothers, who was observed spitting on the floor. Um, and they put on a pantomime, and one of them... You had to have 13 letters in the title. One of them, the Tintock Cup, I was the funniest show I ever, ever saw. And I still think of it as such. There was a laugh every 30 seconds, and it contained talent of the order of Duncan McRae and Stanley Baxter, both playing the dame in the same show, hanging at the windy. And uh, Duncan said to Stanley, here, in, they were in the, in the cloakroom, the ladies' cloak, the powder room of the Barrowland ballroom. And McRae said to Baxter, here, Bella, take my partner, will you? I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> and to come now to the point, the visual arts, um, the Calvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum meant so much to me that I can hardly uh, tell you much about it. Um, I lived on the paintings that it had and regretted the paintings that it didn't have 
for many years. I was too dim to go to the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow, which contains one of the, perhaps the second best collection of Chardin in the world, and also a major collection of the work of Whistler. Uh, but Kelvin Grove would do for me. It had a wonderful Rogier van der Weyden and a terrific Rembrandt, the young man in armour, and pre-Raphaelites. And then it had, to which I owe my ability to enjoy the art of the 20th century, it had one or two um, uh, foves, I suppose you would say. Now, who were... Anyway, I'm thinking of Degas and Cézanne and Manet, two little Manets. One was of a rose in a vase, one was of a piece of ham on a plate, which are among the most beautiful little paintings I've ever seen. There was one Picasso only from a very early period, two or three magnificent Matisses, one called the pink tablecloth that I always loved in which the penguin print thing turned into a print, and there was one and only one Braque. I... Uh, I, I'm now I'm a bit older than the eight o'clock evacuee in Kokubrisha, and I think I know what I enjoy in painting, although I had to buy for two bob each, I should think, or maybe even one and sixpence, the whole run of a series of French paint books that contained in black and white the work of 20 or 30 great masters of painting. They were, called, they were published by Brown A.C., and uh, I used to have to read those to, to work out, you know, the difference between um, um, Michelangelo and Piero della Francesca or Poussin or Claude or whatever. And um, so that when I eventually got to see those paintings that were not present, present in Kelvin Grove, but were in the National Gallery in London or the Uffizi or the Louvre, I was bowled over. Now, Tom Honeyman, of whom... Uh, whom by this time I'd already thought I knew as much as he did and what did he think he was doing. He spent £12,000 on buying a, a painting by Salvador Dali called Christ of St. John of the Cross. And Christ hangs on the crucifix and it said, as is said of one or two other paintings, that the eyes follow you around the room. And I wrote to the paper to complain that we only had one little inadequate, very early painting by Picasso, and one, two by Matisse, and one by Braque, and why were we spending all that, I wrote to the Glasgow Herald, why are we spending all this money on the Dali, and, and because I was a bumptious fellow, and I was quite wrong, because Honeyman knew exactly what he was doing, that painting very soon became the most popular painting in the gallery because it meant so much to so many people um, of, of religious persuasion who went to see it. And I had the wonderful experience of being told by Neil McGregor, no less, who was the great director of the National Gallery and is now the best museum director in the world at the British Museum, that that painting meant an enormous amount to Neil. He's a devout Catholic. Uh, and it showed him what he could love. His way into loving great art would be to look at uh, the Christian representation in art. And quite often while he was at the National Gallery, there would be a show which made very plain how good he was at that. Um, in 1942, in the middle of the war, Benno Schatz decided, um, taking other people whom he cared about along with him, Benno Schatz decided that um, there should be an exhibition of Jewish art in Glasgow. I will say that again, Jewish art. One of the things I want to talk about here is whether there can be such a thing as Jewish art. And I only ask the question now. Here's Benno on what he got into his head. I said to myself that there was one exhibition that Tommy Hunneman would not be able to arrange in the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery or even get permission for were he willing to do it. An exhibition that would never enter his mind, an exhibition of Jewish art. The Jews were in the war just like any other people, if not more so, but who would consider them an entity or deserving support and recognition? 
So I would have, says Benno, to do it myself. Joseph Herman became my assistant in this enterprise. Now I pause now simply to remind you that there was a very real sense in the 20th century that Jewish art, if it existed, and Benno believed it did and so did others, had only begun to be possible from the point in the 19th century when Jews got out of the shtetl and out of the ghetto and got into the world and were able to think for themselves outside a rabbinic and Talmudic tradition because and people here who are more expert than I will correct me if I'm wrong, there is a prohibition of the graven image in uh, Jewish the theological uh, text, and there is very little record of art made by Jews over a period of 2,000 years. There is, of course, superbly ornamental work done for liturgical um, items, and the dressing of the cipher tower in the synagogue or the silverware and, you know, that is used in the service is magnificent. And if you go to the museum in Tel Aviv, whose name has escaped me again, uh, Beth Hatzafu Sot, which is the museum of the diaspora, you see the wonderful interiors in marvellous models of 50 great synagogues of the world, complete with their decoration. But there are no paintings of... Uh, Jewish men and women, no paintings of um, drunks or musicians or gamblers or whatever in the Jewish tradition. So the artists whom Benno was now wanting to present to people had Jewish antecedents only going back uh, 40 or 50 years. So here we go. The exhibition opened on the 20th of December 1942 just after the week of mourning for European Jewry in the Jewish Institute in South Portland Street in the Gorbals, not the most fashionable part of Glasgow. By the time that week of mourning um, occurred, uh, Joseph, of course, knew that the whole of his family uh, had been murdered in, in Poland and Germany. Poland, by the Germans or wherever. Uh, People came from all over to visit the show because in this exhibition were shown artists who had never before been seen in Scotland, such as Modigliani, who well, I didn't know was Jewish, Chagall, Zadkin, Bomberg, Manikatz, Soutin, and many others. It was a great success. Honeyman bought the Zadkin music group for the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery. I, says Benno, had told him that if he didn't do it, I would myself. It was too cheap for words. And he wrote an introduction to the catalogue of the show, explaining why they were doing it, and saying, Today, when on the continent of Europe, Jewish life and culture is being systematically and brutally uprooted and destroyed, there is an urgent necessity for, for Jews elsewhere to demonstrate their faith in themselves and their future. It's better for them to build afresh, to build stronger and better in the certain knowledge that given faith, no power on earth can destroy the work of the um, spirit. And uh, the names of the great artists who were in that show um, will say a lot about what a worthwhile show it was. I didn't see it because I was still um, trying to see over the hedge and the, the dike on in my walk to the village school in Kukubrisha, but um, when I went back to Kukubrisha with Gillian, um, I hadn't known, I was very surprised to find how beautiful the countryside was. And the reason is that I couldn't see over the, <laughs> the, the dike at the side of the road. Um, but was there such a thing as Jewish art? Benno Schatz said, then that Joseph Herman was not a Jewish artist because of his Jewish birth, but because the subject matter he was depicting uh, was Jewish. As you can see, not in all these paintings, those are pretty certainly not Jews at all, and probably people Benno met, those six portraits, people Benno met in the Polish army that he was briefly in, we think, perhaps. But anyway, the rest of it is self-evidently 
memory and uh, you know, Jewish life in the ghetto of Warsaw and so on and so on and so forth. Well, Benno's explanation of why Joseph was a Jewish artist may make sense for everything in this show, but it can't make sense for what he did in Wales or what he did in Mexico or Burgundy or Israel when he went there and painted people planting, digging, driving tractors, picking grapes or whatever. Uh, no, Joseph and many of the other artists in that 1942 show were, to my mind, artists first and Jewish for the, in the second place. Now, perhaps you'd like to debate that when I've shut up in a moment. What is true, which is a separate point altogether, is that in the Second World War, arts in Britain and interest in the arts exploded. Uh, you will remember Humphrey Jennings' marvellous documentary, which I think is called Letter to Timothy. Is that right, David? Or Diary for Timothy or something? And you see Myra Hess playing in the um, National Gallery, and the commentator tells us that the, she is playing German music, Timothy. Uh, but there was, we know, in the publications of Penguin, in attendance in theatres, you know, concert halls and so on and so forth, a passion for the arts. Uh, in 1946, the people of Glasgow, whom uh, Benno Short thought, well, he was writing particularly about the Jews in Glasgow, but the people in Glasgow who were frightened of modern art, um, turned out in their thousands to see the great exhibition of the work of Picasso and Matisse that they had uh, created during the German occupation of France during the Second World War. It was shown in London, in Glasgow, and other places in the UK. Kelvin Grove City Art Gallery and Museum is 150 yards long, end to end, and the queue in the snow outside went all the way around the building and half back again. <clears throat> and so it was no surprise when in 1951, when it was said that Britain would have a festival, the Festival of Britain in 1951, Benno decided that um, Glasgow should have one too. And um, here we go. Period of great, 1950 is one of the great activity, responsibility, and committee meetings. The 1951 Festival of Britain was already being planned. Glasgow, he says, had more than once led the field in Jewish matters, and it was nearly 10 years since we had staged our first Jewish art exhibition. Why then limit our venture to books alone? There had been an exhibition of Judaica at the Mitchell. Why not embrace the whole gamut of Jewish culture in a festival of Jewish art? So it was going to have an art exhibition, a book exhibition, an exhibition of ritual objects, a concert, a dramatic performance, lectures, and a section dealing with the Holocaust. It turned out to be a vast project, but I managed to gather round me a nucleus of enthusiasts who carried the burden willingly and worked endlessly to get the best results. Uh, we were able to carry out such a tremendous task because we were a closely knit community. Glasgow had 30,000 Jews, but everyone knew what was going on. Had we been a large community like London, he suggests, it would have been difficult um, to find people who would work in harmony and unison. After our festival, it became imperative for London jury to do something, so in due course, they staged an art exhibition which was hardly even an echo of ours. And the book contains a list of the principal event, events of the exhibition. That exhibition, um, in the same way as did the London exhibition of painting for the Festival of Britain. It was a great show in Suffolk Street in the galleries of, I think, what was then the Royal Society of Portrait Painters or something, called 60 Paintings for 51. They were big, big paintings, each of them. I'd never seen a show of 60 paintings that sort of size. And one of the best of them was a painting by Joseph Herman. I mention that now 
simply to ram home that by that time, with um, six years in Wales behind him and four more years to come, I think I'm right in saying, he, uh, he had made, he'd made it, uh, not just in Glasgow, but in the conspectus of, of the whole of the UK and to some extent Europe too, and he was invited to be one of those 60 people. I had a falling out with Benno Schatz, um, just still as bumptious um, at that time, because Benno was firmly of the view that um, the future for the Jewish artist uh, lay in Israel. And I thought, this can't be right, you know. Um, if the work that we've shown in 42 and 51 uh, is so marvelous, it looks to me as if painters can um, do a pretty good job in the diaspora, or indeed anywhere in the world. They don't have to be in Israel. And I think one of the interesting things which people more expert and I will know about uh, is whether is how good the visual arts in Israel actually are. Pretty good, I think, but not necessarily sensational. Um, no, uh, here's Herman on the walls in this painting show in 51, and he's certainly made a mark. So make no mistake, what is shown here in this gallery now is early work by a great master. Work uh, painted, in some cases, as much from memory as from observation. Work that he quite overtly and deliberately sought to put behind him when he wanted to move on to other subjects, other modes of expression, and perhaps one great subject and mode of expression. And he did do that, and we honor him for it. But what this show makes crystal clear to me, and I hope to you, is that his talent burned bright early. It's impossible to look at what's on these walls here, downstairs and in this room, without seeing somebody who can paint with strength, with force, uh, gripping work that's carefully observed. And the paintings do indeed breathe life, as Tom Honeyman said they did, and um, they smell of humanity. You can smell it as you look at them because that's what he was trying to paint. And in every phase of his painting, he found a humanity in the people he painted, an ease and dignity in particular in their working lives. Not many other artists have taken that as their subject matter. Some have, Courbet perhaps, Millet. Uh, I saw a sort of card advertising a show that is going to be at Mons in Belgium when uh, it is capital of culture in European in 1916, in 2016. And uh, Mons is in Wallonia, it's a Walloon French speaking city in Belgium, and it has the poorest um, landscape and standard of living in the whole of Belgium, and it's mining country. And the, the work I saw to illustrate the coming of this show uh, would make a very interesting, it's about miners, would make a very interesting comparison with what Joseph did in Wales. And it's on a smaller scale, but it's Van Gogh. You know, it's pretty bloody good. And uh, that will be what they will show in that year, and I'm going to go and go and, sh and see it. And um, here is what Douglas Hall wrote about Joseph in The Independent for the 22 of February, 22nd of February in the year 2000. It's the first paragraph of his obituary of Joseph Herman. And he says, of all the painters of Polish origin who found asylum in Britain during the early years of the Second World War, the one who most won the hearts and minds of the British was Joseph Herman. His death at the age of 89 will sadden many who have little to do with the art world. Happily, his strength did not give out before the astonishing late flowering of his work, triumphantly evident at his last two exhibitions at the Boundary Gallery, where we actually are now, and at Flowers East in London in 1998. 
I think that it is imperative that there should be, and the sooner the better, a grand retrospective of the whole of Herman's work in which all of this period, that great big masterpieces of what was done in Wales, the joyous things that were done uh, until the end of his life. His son David tells me that Joseph painted every single day, got up early in the morning and painted, and he was pretty bloody good at it. And what we need is to see all that uh, in one show. And I look forward to Ben Uri when it has got the resources and the space to do it, to astonishing the world by putting it on. Thank you for listening to me. Well, you take questions from the floor, I hope. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Can I, can I just kick us off, just because you're a Glaswegian from top to toe. Do you think that any of the Glasgow character actually rubbed off on Herman, either through his art or in his personality? Well, I think he, his, his personality and his interests um, were shared by some of the Glasgow folk he met. I don't mean the posh West End life of the people that bought his <coughs> paintings, but I mean, if he ever went into a Glasgow pub, you'll have seen the same people as he, you know, as he was capable of getting on with. So I do think that. I, I also think, and I meant to mention it in the previous paragraph, that to say, as I think you, David, said uh, at the opening of this show, I meant, by the way, to say earlier that the last time I saw Miraham Mesh was at that opening in this space. Um, that that this, we see here a totally different painter from what we were to know of Herman later on. I don't agree with that, as I think I said at the time, but I think I'm only really quibbling about words. And nobody is going to deny that the paintings here are different from some of the paintings, of many of, all of the paintings that came afterwards. But when Picasso, who painted this funny little um, flower, not flower arrangement, flowers market picture in Barcelona when he was only 18 years old or something, we don't say that he was a totally different painter uh, from the Picasso of Cubism or post-Cubism or whatever. We say that we've en he entered, as he has done more productively than any other painter, a different phase of his career. He just said, that's enough of that, I'm going to do something else. And Joseph, in a way, uh, did the same thing. So I think that a lot, I think the people of Glasgow and the people of Cardiff and the people of, of Warsaw, you know, could all see things in Joseph's painting to which they responded. Next question. Sir. Yeah. Uh, did Joseph Hammond work with the, uh, the Glasgow Unity Theatre? So the, the left wing theatre in Glasgow? Yes. And what kind of work did he do? He designed costumes and scenery, and it's gloriously displayed here. And it was very influential. If you've got stuff as good as that, you know what your play is going to look like. And this, this wonderful show, which I didn't see because I was in Kokubisha, uh, this wonderful show was called We Are This Land. And um, it's about the nobility of the worker and the evil of the... Um, policeman and the traitor and the millionaire and the SS and you know and, he, and there was a lot of that in Glasgow because there was the Unity Theatre in Glasgow did that had a tradition of that for years and even the great Glasgow Jewish Institute play I don't know whether you've ever seen a play called Morning Star you ever seen Morning Star Morning Star is about a, a terrible fire in New York in the closing district where hundreds of young Jewish women were uh, learning, were making clothes, and there was a terrible fire, and two or three hundred of them died in the fire. And that's one of the plays, that's one of the plays that the Glasgow Jewish Institute players took to the final of the Sunday Times competition. And boy, that was a weepy with a punch if ever I saw one, you know. Good. Uh, who were the artists at the time that you did mix with in Glasgow and Edinburgh when you went through to the salon? 
Who were who were the artists in Glasgow at the time that he did mix with? Do you know well, we know he met. Um, I don't think he, I don't know, you know, very much about who he met. I don't think he met D. Y. Cameron or Muirhead Bone or even a great painter like MacTaggart. Uh, but he certainly knew a wonderful painter whom Scotland claims, although she was English, called Joan Eardley. And Joan Eardley's paintings of kids in the slums of Anderston in Glasgow uh, are um, paintings that owe something to Herman. I'm sure she owed something to Herman. And um, Mira Hammermesh, by the way, studied from, under Herman at the Slade. Um, so good people learn from good people. Um, but pleasant and, and excellent Scottish painters like William Crosby are not doing the same kind of thing as Herman was at all. I don't think he... I don't think he intended to be part of a group, ever. He was always true to himself in his vision of what he wanted to paint. And other artists would respect that, I think. But if you can think of a Scottish painter who owes more to him or he to them, please say. Yeah, that, that's why I was wondering, because yeah. having lived there for such a long time, he, uh, he was obviously mixing. Well, he didn't. He learned more from Constant Permeke in Belgium than he learned from anybody in Scotland. Uh, and I am ashamed to say that although I go to Brussels a bit, I haven't yet been to see the Permakers in the Musée des Beaux Arts. But I'm going the next time I'm there, and they are of working people, and um, statuesque working people almost in agriculture, in the fields, and so on, and peasants and people that worked physically very hard. And that was something which meant a lot to Joseph, although, uh, uh, you know, he was a highly literate and extremely intelligent, cultivated fellow. But he wanted to paint, because he was not painting what was going on in people's heads, at least I don't think he was. He was painting what they expressed in their body language. What he gave them was a body language of assurance of capacity to work hard and be happy in it or be resigned to it or be on top of it and um, every time you see a man on a tractor in a Joseph painting you think that chap's enjoying driving that tractor <laughs> Can I take you back to the issue about Jewish artists if I may yeah. and I wonder whether you, you've got a view as to whether the fact that in, in both in the 40s and the 50s, Benno could actually create a, an exhibition of Jewish artists where all the great international Jewish artists actually participated. And it wasn't coming to London and New York, it was actually coming to Glasgow. Yeah. And yeah. they were all perfectly happy and supportive of actually being involved in that. Yeah. And I wonder whether it's a question of, 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 of timing and history that in the well, 40s... Sorry. Yes, I, I think that the explosion of this... Jewish art, or, if you like, art by Jewish artists, uh, was related to this business of the time lag between getting out of the ghetto and finding out what other people were doing and teaching yourself to paint. But, but I, I can vividly remember the um, two of the great artists who were in the 42 show and I think in the 51 show also were Chaim uh, Soutin and Jules Pascal. And the picture that I saw of uh, Soutine, by Soutine, was of a carcass of an ox hanging on a butcher's hook. Now, there's nothing Jewish about that, you know. If you like beef, you're interested in it, and it was marvellously well painted. The Pasca, if I remember correctly, was, um, was um, a landscape. But, and uh, you see, this festival that Benno did included music. Now, I made an ass of myself writing something about which I was pointed out to me I knew nothing. Um, about Jewish musicians, Jewish composers, by having gone to the sh show, listened to concerts, in which it's quite plain to me now, some of the composers were Jewish, and not just obviously Bloch and Bruch, but for example, Darius Mio, a composer I like very much. I didn't know he was Jewish. Um, but I also thought that other people whose work was in these programs might have been Jewish too. And so I wrote about Ravel, but somebody called Goldberg, what's the name, Julie, of that chap? That Greenberg, Rodney Greenberg, 
wrote to me to say, or wrote to the paper to say, much worse, Jeremy's an absolute idiot. Ravel was not Jewish. He was born in, you know, Lorraine or somewhere, uh, <coughs> house country. So, and, and if you listened, another Jewish composer, according to the Glasgow Festival of Jewish Art, was Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi. Now, Mendelssohn's grandparents were Jewish. His parents converted to Christianity. I defy anybody um, to find out what's Jewish in Me Elijah, he might claim, is a Jewish work of art. But um, the Italian symphony, the songs without words, the overture to Fingal's Cave, surely not. He was a musician, not a Jewish musician. Yes, but can I follow it up by asking you, what? the fact, the fact that, that these artists were happy and prepared to be in, included in an exhibition of Jewish art, yeah. they all positively agreed, they must have had a letter and a representation, was a matter of, of historical timing, because it's society, the wave of emancipation in Paris and in France and in Holland and in the UK hadn't yet come. And what I'm, what I'm wondering what your view is, whether in fact it was because the, the Jewish community had to be very tight and very supportive of each other that the Jewish art had. I think that Benno, bless him, um, was a lovely man. Um, in, in his introduction to the 1942 exhibition, is in fact saying we are being murdered by the million. Um, we must assert what we can do. And I think that none of those artists could have refused to take part in the show at that time. And they'd only refuse to take part in it at any other time if they were so grand that they could, they'd rather be in a private show in New York or Moscow or Beijing or whatever. But um, I think the notion of the Jewish artist has nothing like the currency today that it did for Ben Schwartz. Surely that's right. Absolutely, I'm sure and you're that, right. You reminded me, because I can't remember half of these things, but he tells me that I chaired a meeting. But wasn't it held in Bond Street at Bonhams or something like that, about <coughs> Jewish art, which had something to do with the founding or the removal of Ben Uri from one venue to another. And Norman Rosenthal was scathing about the concept of Jewish artists, and he just said, come on, they're artists. And just following up on that, I think you're right uh, to question Jewish art, but one of the things we've seen in many of the <coughs> recent exhibitions we've had over the past three or four years is the sense of the artists we have shown who clearly were not part of the society they were painting. They, were, they had something, it may not have been because they were Jewish, it could have been because they were immigrants, it could have been because they didn't feel, but because they were Jewish, but didn't feel accepted within that wider society. But they certainly, there is a, you, you'll find it, I think, even, for example, in the Floyd exhibition, uh, that, that intense observation. Well, he gets that from his grandfather. Hmm? He gets that from his grandfather. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, but, too, but Joseph, is a, Joseph himself is an absolutely living proof of a someone who was capable of joining a community, mm -hmm. belonging to a community, being accepted by a community, rejoicing in the fact that in Wales, everybody in the village said, what well, evening, Joseph, you know, he was part of them. It wasn't, didn't mean he was imprisoned by it, and at a certain point, he moved on, but he wasn't an outsider at all. Um, uh, David? Well, I think one of the things is that strikes me about that period is that, of course, he spent a lot of time in London with largely Jewish refugee friends, yes, and Yiddish poets, Munger, uh, yes, but Spencer, not in Wales, not in Wales, not at all in Wales. Yes. But I think he had two sort of completely different lives, yes. which never seemed to really come together. Mm -hmm. And I think what he seemed to be quite good at was putting a sort of his Jewish interests in one place, in one part of his life, yeah. uh, helping found the Jewish quarterly, which matters to his passion and stuff. And on the other hand, having a completely non-Jewish life uh, in another completely non-Jewish community. Bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. If it's bedtime, then. I can only say that it's well worthwhile now we're ready to go to bed. It's been a fantastic evening.
We are greatly privileged uh, to have you. This is Oscar season, BAFTA season. <laughs> Can I ask you, without embarrassing you, has anybody in the UK actually has got more than six BAFTAs? What? Has anybody got oh. more BAFTAs than you? Yes, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I, I don't think so, but I, and I think I mean, just, it's just remarkable that we've actually yeah, had this video. <laughs> I'll tell you. Go on. Well, I'll tell you my BAFTA awards stories, you know, on. one of which is, goes that I was sitting, by the way, in the Hippodrome at the corner of Leicester Square for a ceremony one year, and um, it was the Brideshead revis Revisited Year, and... Anthony Andrews got a, the prize for the best actor of the year. And he made a speech in which he said, I thank God for Charles Sturridge, <laughs> who had the task of directing me in this production. And I went, yeah. <laughs> and Lindsay Anderson was sitting beside me. And he said, Jeremy, you haven't heard anything yet. <laughs> Next year, for an even better piece of drama than Brideshead Revisited, which was called The Boys from the Black Stuff, or of the Black Stuff, from yeah. the Black Stuff, yeah. um, and a marvellous, dashing fellow and a brilliant director called Philip Savile got the Director's Award, and he walked up onto the rostrum, um, making gestures like this, you know, as if he was saying, down pride, down. <laughs> but when he got up there, he made a speech in which he said, I thank God, who at this critical moment of the 20th century has placed me in the most powerful medium known to man, television. So I don't like going to BAFTAs unless I'm going to get a prize. But when I do go, uh, I enjoy this. Well, I mean, I, I, just other people's speeches that register, not anything I have to say. Hey, let's go home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.